Hey Citrix admins, welcome to a multi-part series on how to set up your Citrix environment really from, from the very beginning. So throughout this series, I'll walk you through different things of how to install different Citrix components. Um, for, in this video, we're gonna talk about the prerequisites required prior to a Citrix implementation. And also my goal is for all of you watching this series is to have a better takeaway and understanding the different components of Citrix. So a part of this series will include a whiteboard component. So we could go through the, the communication of the, the different components that make up a Citrix environment. However, with any good Citrix deployment, of course, we require some prerequisites as well as some considerations. So the first part of this video today, I will be walking you through some of the required prereqs as well as some things to think about before your actual implementation. And I won't go through everything. There's so much that fits under that Citrix umbrella, but I will give you some things to think about and some tools to look at to make sure you do your due diligence prior to your implementation. So let's look at the prereqs first. So this is what our environment is gonna look like for, for this video series. So we're gonna have two delivery controllers, which by the way, that, that's basically your broker server within a Citrix environment. Um, also, we're gonna incorporate our director servers on those delivery controllers. So director is your monitoring component of your Citrix environment. We're gonna have a single Citrix license server. And the reason we are only gonna do one in this case is because if it does go down, it's not as big a deal because Citrix does give you a 90 day grace period automatically to bring up that new license server and relicense that server. And, and by the way, speaking of high availability, which I'll talk upon on the considerations, you always want to do N plus one. So the reason we're doing two delivery controllers, two storefront servers is because we want to ensure that if one goes down, users will still be able to connect to the second. But in the case of your environment, you're always going to want to account for N plus one. So let's say you have 6,000 users. Well, in the case of 6,000 users, you're going to need two delivery controllers to manage that amount of users. Um, on average, around four gigs for CPU can manage around 5,000 users. So that's where we get those two. But we want to account for N plus one. So you'd want at minimum three delivery controllers to be able to manage that entire load. Because if you only had two and one went down, well, that one won't be able to handle your, your actual workload. So I am accounting for high availability here. It will change depending on your environment. We're also gonna need a SQL server, which by the way, for SQL, I think Citrix supports a minimum of 2008 R2. So if you're on at least 2008 R2, you should be good to go. You could also use SQL Express, but there are some considerations with SQL versus SQL Express. But if you are a small shop, if you're just doing a proof of concept, you can absolutely use, use Express for this. We're gonna have two Citrix ADCs, aka Netscaler, and we're gonna be utilizing that for the load balancing capabilities as well as the gateway component for remote access. And depending on if you're doing virtual apps or virtual desktops, you may need RDS cows. So if you're doing Citrix virtual apps, you're gonna want at least two RDS servers, which I won't show in this video series, but do know you will, you will need that um, and the reason you want to in this case is because unlike Citrix, where it gives you that 90 day grace period, um, RDS doesn't work the same. You will want a second for redundancy. Also on, on, the, on the similar note, so you'll see some of the sizing graphs on the right, this table's there. So the reason I put that there is because I get asked questions all the time about sizing and hardware requirements for a Citrix environment. And the fact of the matter is that it really depends on so many different factors. So I always ask questions like, well, what's your tolerance for outages? Do you need high availability? What applications are in your environment? How do you users work on a daily basis? Are you looking to do a desktop operating system versus a server operating system? because that, that makes the entire environment different depending on that answer. And, and really the, the best answer to this question is to test your workload. So test it in some type of pilot phase 
or use some type of third party software that's out there, such as maybe like a Lakeside, a Logon VSI, um, you name it. But as a general rule of thumb, so taking this straight from Citrix's VDI handbook, for your actual VDA size, sizing, um, a light workload, so users that are using very, very little amount of applications, very light applications, you might want to allocate two vCPU and two to three gigs of RAM per user, uh, medium four, three to four RAM, and a high four vCPU um, four plus or five plus um, gigs of RAM. Same for database sizing, there are some kind of considerations for that. But if you are under 5,000 users, just do two CPU, four gigs of RAM, and you should be good from a Citrix perspective. I also put a link on the bottom there. I'll, I'll put it in the description as well. There are some system requirements that Citrix provides. So just make sure you go through that and make sure you meet all those requirements, such as server operating system requirements for the infrastructure pieces. Um, but if you are more up to date, you shouldn't have any problem there. Of course, there's a hardware sizing um, pieces to this as well. So you can see that depending on operating system, Citrix gives kind of a kind of ballpark value of how many users you could get per core. And if you are using things such as antivirus, um, Office, 360, Office 2016, 2013, um, there are some server density impacts to that and you can see those here as well. So again, I'll provide the link for everyone so you can take a look at these. I just wanted to, to show this because this is gonna be an important factor if you are looking at, at sizing your hardware. Um, so some considerations, the, the first consideration we're gonna be looking at is your user groups. So you'll wanna make sure you have clearly defined what type of, what type of users you have within your organization. Um, more likely than not, users in this group is going to, are gonna use different applications from users in that group. And it's just important to understand this to ensure a smoother rollout when you're creating your virtual desktops and application servers, because there's a lot of considerations that go into this application layering, image management, which we'll, we'll touch upon in a little bit. And also on that same note, make sure to define, clearly define what profile type works best for your deployment. So I have them all listed here. So there's four different local roaming, mandatory, and hybrid. Roaming is probably the most common you'll see in deployments in which case a roaming prof profile essentially allows your users to make changes to their profile to be able to do a certain level of customization. So if I'm logged on to computer A and I change my des desktop background and I log on to computer B, when I log into my Citrix environment on that second computer, my background should stay the same with the roaming profile. Um, local profiles, a little different. I'm sure most of you know what that is. Um, you can still make changes, but it's it's stuck on that individual machine itself. So there's no roaming capabilities, even though there is some customization available locally on that machine. Uh, mandatory profile, it's kind of like a roaming profile in that you have a centralized location, but all of your changes, they're reverted after log, log off. So you're not act, your, user, your user base isn't allowed to actually make customizations to their profile. And then lastly, hybrid, which I'll be honest, I have very little to no experience with. Essentially, it's a combination of both mandatory and local profiles. I think that it's built for some security reasons. Um, so just take a note, read over it, see if that's applicable to you. And then of course, folder redirection. Um, this is also recommended to, minif to minimize your, your profile size. So essentially, you're gonna be redirecting all of your static um, content, so your your Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, videos, photos, you name it. And really the benefit of this is it'll drastically reduce the amount of time it takes to load a profile and log on. So imagine if you have two gigs worth of static data and every time you're pulling that entire two gigs down, well, that will take forever to log on. We want to give our users a good experience, not a poor experience. So in the case of folder redirection, users are accessing all of those static documents on demand. 
One thing to note with folder redirection as well, make sure to test it before putting it into production. Um, the reason being is sometimes you will run into application related issues where they might be doing a lot of read and writes and it might cause issue if you're redirecting app data. So just, just make sure you test it. Um, and with, uh, with all this being said, there, there's still a lot of considerations when it comes down to users and profiles, but it just doesn't make sense to go over all of that within this video today. Instead, again, I'll link the VDI handbook in the comment box below. So definitely take a look at it, read all the considerations, and a lot of it will be trial and error, especially if you are new to Citrix. Um, but this information is, is going to be critical as you're planning your Citrix rollout. Um, some other considerations. So I, you'll see policies there, but I don't want to get into what policies you should really configure. But I do recommend deciding on your preferred policy engine right up front. In other words, you can either configure your Citrix policies through Citrix's management console, which we'll see later is called Citrix Studio in, in another video, or you can actually configure Citrix policies via group policy management. So if you want to utilize Citrix's ADMX files, you absolutely can. But really, I've seen so many times where there's just policies configured here, policies configured there. It just becomes a nightmare to understand what's actually set up in that Citrix environment. So choose one location and, and make sure that you continue to utilize that, that policy engine moving forward. Um, it's also recommended to define a baseline policy. And essentially this baseline policy is gonna be all of your common elements across your entire user base. You probably have some type of baseline policy in place today, but you will want to incorporate a baseline Citrix policy to that as well. And that will just ease of complexity and that'll be applied to all of your users. And you'll probably want to apply that at the lowest priority because if you are making specific settings to different user groups, um, we'll make sure that those settings, I guess, supersede um, the baseline policy. Um, Printing is also a consideration. Again, not going to go too deep into it, but I do want to ensure everybody takes a look at, at the printing capabilities of Citrix, especially if that's important to your organization. So really understanding things such as, are you doing network printing, client-based printing? How does Citrix handle those? Do you know about Citrix's uniform? Um, universal print driver, um, Citrix's auto creation of printers, um, print servers, so on and so forth. So just take a look at the VDI handbook. There's a whole section on printing. There's videos out there on YouTube that talks about printing. Highly recommend taking a look at that. Um, image management's also a, this ginormous topic. I actually did an entire video series on provisioning services. So if you're looking at looking for content on that, definitely take a look at that video series. Um, it is applicable to, to boot device manager. I didn't cover Pixie or DHCP um, with TFTP yet. Um, hopefully I will in the future. Um, but you do have three options when it comes to image management. So if you're a small shop, you can absolutely just manually provision all of your machines, which basically means you have your workloads, your app servers, your VDIs, where you're managing them individually and you're installing the VDA on those. And let's say you're, you're creating copies of that from a snapshot, whatever they can, or a template, whatever the case may be, you can manually provision your machines. Um, you can utilize Citrix's machine creation services, which is built into all Citrix virtual apps and desktop solutions. Essentially, you create a, a connection to your, to your hypervisor. Um, the hypervisor takes, we'll use a snapshot of your master image and it'll provision new machines based on that snapshot. And it'll even automatically create the machine accounts that go with it. So a lot of options with machine creation services. And also um, there is the ability of doing IO with RAM. So a lot of new capabilities that came out with that to really um, enhance the performance. And then of course, provisioning services, which is essentially, it's, a, it's an, an entitlement with um, a higher addition of Citrix licensing. So it will require additional infrastructure, but essentially you can, you can manage um, a virtual disk 
and you can do versioning on that virtual disk and stream your your virtual disk to multiple mach machines at once. So there's a lot of great capabilities when it comes to provisioning services. So let's say you need to make an up update, you have your base V disk, your base virtual disk, you can create a version of that virtual disk, make the changes you need, put it in test mode, test it out, make sure it's working, then flip the switch on production, then all of your target devices that are booting from that will boot to that new production version as soon as they reboot. If something did go wrong, you can just revert back to the pre previous version. So a lot of great capabilities for for troubleshooting also will save you, save you a lot in storage because now you don't have to assign an entire disk to all of your target devices. You just need a small write cache drive for your temporary writes. So a lot of great capabilities with that. Um, some other considerations, so high availability. Again, I mentioned this before, but what's your tolerance level for failure? If it's if if you do require some set of high availability, I definitely recommend utilizing a load balancer, whether that be a Citrix ADC, aka Netscaler, or another solution. Um, yeah, I definitely recommend that. The benefit, of course, of a, of utilizing a Netscaler is it has some built-in monitoring capabilities with. Um, the, the Netscaler appliance, so you can actually monitor things like the authentication service that's running on the storefront server. So if that was, for some reason went down, it can redirect all users to the one that, that's up and running. So a lot of capabilities there. Um, endpoint selection, so when I say endpoint, I actually mean like your actual clients you're going to be connecting to, to your Citrix environment from. So this is really gonna vary depending on each of you, but let's say you're up for PC refresh. Well, now you have to consider, now that I have all of these workloads that are gonna be running within my data center, what should I give my users on the endpoint? And most of you, most of you probably wanna save some sort of money, so you'll probably utilize some type of thin client. But what type of thin client do you want to utilize? Um, I personally have a lot of experience with iGel. I love their management console. Makes it extremely easy. If you are in, next to a PC refresh, iGel has capabilities of being able to re reuse that hardware with something called a UD pocket. So it'll convert it to a thin client. Um, but maybe you want to use Dellwise, HP, doesn't really matter, um, BYOD. But that is a consideration as you're trying to be more cost effective by implementing a Citrix environment. Um, internal versus remote access. So this is all about our users going to be accessing my environment, both internal as well as remote. Or are they going to be just internal? And if they are accessing remote, do we want to put some type of multi-factor authentication in place for my environment for those remote users? And that could be either federated services using, let's say, like an Okta or um, an Azure AD. Maybe you want to do a Radius with something like um, RSA. Um, a lot of options when it comes to MFA, and there's there's tons of guides out there of how to configure that. Optimizations is a big one, so just make sure you apply your Citrix optimizations to to your actual master image. And there's both Citrix optimizations as well as VMware optimizations. These will essentially optimize your, your master image, so your Windows 10 VDI, or let's say your Windows 2012 R2 or 2016 um, application server to have the best um, Windows settings applied to it to enhance the user experience when it comes to a virtual environment. My rule of thumb is apply both if you can. I mean, Citrix optimizations and VMware optimizations, I always just apply both of those optimization recommendations to my actual virtual delivery agents. Um, site and forest design. So this is a huge topic. Again, it's going to vary a lot depending on each of you. But if you are a more complex shop, let's say you have multi-domain, you have 10 different data centers, you may want to consider bringing in a partner or Citrix Consulting Services to help design your environment if you don't have a lot of Citrix expertise. And the reason being is there's a, a slew of ways of how to configure a Citrix environment. And it's really hard to design that environment without that level of expertise because Citrix really does touch everything within that environment. So just know that that is gonna be a consideration of how you're gonna design your overall environment. 
um, certificates. So you're going to want an external certificate if you are utilizing a uh, Citrix ADC gateway, a Netscaler gateway, and you can get that from, from things like GoDaddy. And I, I did create a video of how to utilize a GoDaddy certificate for your gateway. You'll also want an internal certificate for your storefront server because we will need to encrypt that traffic as well via HTTPS. And I did create a video for that as well. So I won't go through that in this video series, but no, you will need those certificates um, for, for this actual series. And then lastly, Citrix Cloud. So this is a, an interesting subject. If all this sounds really overwhelming right now and you just don't have either the partnership with somebody to, to manage this for you, or you don't have the expertise in house, well, maybe consider having Citrix manage that for you. So Citrix Cloud is kind of a loose term. Essentially, Citrix has a lot of different services that they offer as, uh, as a, a service, I guess. Um, and a couple of those services are Citrix Virtual Apps as a service, Citrix Virtual Desktops as a service, and essentially Citrix will manage all of the infrastructure components for you. So the delivery controller, storefront server, um, license server, all of that will be managed by Citrix. It'll be up to date by Citrix. They'll ensure that there's high availability built into it. And the only thing you're gonna have to have on your end is you're gonna host the workloads. So either the virtual desktops or virtual application servers. And you're gonna have something called a cloud connector, which by the way, once you install that cloud connector, and you create a connection to Citrix Cloud, Citrix will manage and update that for you automatically. So really the only thing you're concerned about is managing your master images and all of your VDIs, your workloads, so to speak. So hopefully that helped a little bit. So again, we're gonna go through an entire series of building out a Citrix environment. I put some of these considerations in place, but no, this is gonna be a pretty vanilla environment. I'll try to walk through things such as um, profile management, doing installations, so on and so forth, as well as a whiteboard session. But if there is anything in particular any of you are interested in seeing or need more help on and you would like to see a video for that, definitely let me know by writing in the comment box below. Also, if you did like this video, I really appreciate it if you give me a thumbs up. Um, check out my website for some other great Citrix content, mnltechzone.com. Um, otherwise, until the next video. Thanks, guys.